Today we start to use the math and theory that we've been working on for the last few weeks to actually solve Maxwell's equations in what is arguably the simplest case, and that is a description of plane waves in simple media and explicitly infinite simple media. So in a simple medium, we've seen that Maxwell's equations can be distilled down to the Helmholtz equation. And the scalar homogeneous Helmholtz equation would be Laplacian of A plus beta squared A is equal to zero, where A could represent either one of the components of the vector magnetic potential or one of the components of the electric a vector potential um, or one of the components of E or of H. Right? Those all satisfy the homogeneous Helmholtz equation in a source-free region. So we also are assuming there are no sources. So we're just trying to solve for the waves that can exist in that infinite space. And remember here that beta squared is just the name we give to omega squared mu epsilon. So this is a material with magnetic and dielectric properties mu and epsilon, which could be complex, but at first we'll assume that they're, they're real. So what is this in rectangular coordinates? Well, in rectangular coordinates, the Laplacian is the sum of the second derivatives. So you got the second derivative in x, second derivative in y, plus the second derivative in z, plus beta squared a, is equal to zero. Now, this is a partial differential equation because it's a relation between various partial derivatives of the function we're trying to solve for. And generally, PDEs, partial differential equations, are much more difficult to solve than ODEs, the ordinary differential equations that we've reviewed so far in this course. And there are few systematic techniques for solving partial differential equations. One of those is the so-called method of separation of variables. And the idea here is to look for a solution, A of x, y, and z, that factors as f of x times g of y times h of z. And hopefully, plugging that into our partial differential equation will allow us to separate out three different equations, one for each of the variables. And here's the argument. Um, if we can substitute this into the partial differential equation, and it's possible to isolate, say, all of the x dependents, say, over on the left side of the equation, so that we end up with an equation that looks like b of x, and then all the y and z dependents is on the right side, so let's say some function c of y and z. Then, here's the, the key argument. The left side is a function of x alone. The right side is a function of y and z alone. The right side, therefore, is not a function of x. But the two sides are equal, and therefore the left side cannot be a function of x. It must be a constant. Let's call that k sub x. So we get an equation that looks like this. b of x is equal to k sub x, and that only involves x, and that would be an ordinary differential equation. So then we replace, after we solve that, we replace b of x by the constant case, k sub x, and then hopefully we can separate out the y and the z dependents here. And then say we end up with something that looks like d of y equals e of z, all the y dependents on the left, all the z dependents on the right. Again, the argument is that the left is uh, a function of y alone, and the right is a function of z alone. Well, the right is not a function of y, 
but the left is equal to the right, so the left can't be a function of y either. It must be, therefore, a constant. Let's call that ky. So solve that. Um, and likewise, solve for the e of z, which also then would necessarily have to be a constant. Okay, so that's the idea of separation of variables. And if it works, it gives us one, two, three ordinary differential equations to solve for the functions f of x, g of y, h of z. So let's do this. Let's apply this to our problem. Let's write a of x, y, and z is f of x, g of y, h of z. And in our differential equation, we need the second derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So what is the second derivative with respect to x of a? And we'll drop the of x, of y, et cetera now for compactness. Well, it would just be two derivatives of the f of x. So that would be f double prime, nor, or ordinary second derivative of f times g times h. Likewise, the second derivative with respect to y of a would be, let's see, f doesn't depend on y, g, you'd have two derivatives of that, so g double prime and h doesn't depend on y. And the second derivative with respect to z of a would be f, g, h double prime. And therefore, we plug that in and our differential equation here is gonna become f double prime gh, that's the second x derivative, and then f g double prime h, that's the second y derivative, and then f g h double prime, that's the second derivative with respect to, uh, to z, and then plus beta squared a, and a is f g h. And now we want to try to isolate the x dependence on the left. Now, the x dependence would be all the f terms. So let's see if we can do that. So we've reduced our equation to f double prime gh plus f g double prime h plus f g h double prime plus beta squared f g h is equal to zero. So let's divide both sides by f g h. Right? What's going to happen in the first term? The g and the h will cancel, but then we'll be left with f double prime over f. For the second term, the f and the h will cancel. We'll be left with g double prime over g. For the third term, the f and the g will cancel, leaving h double prime over h, and in the third term, or fourth term rather, f, g, and h will all cancel, leaving just beta squared. Well, now it's very simple to see that we can definitely isolate the x or the y or the z dependence. Just move, for example, leave the first term over on the left, f double prime over f, move everything else to the right. So that'd be minus g double prime over g, plus h double prime over h plus beta squared. And by the arguments we gave previously, the left side is a function of x alone. The right side is not a function of x. So the left side, which is equal to that, also is not a function of x. It therefore must be a constant. And let's call this constant minus beta x squared. That's going to be our kx. Now, in that form, it's still completely general because beta x could be an arbitrary complex number, so we could set minus beta x squared to be an arbitrary complex number. But that form does suggest that the most important case will be where beta x is real, and then this constant has the form minus beta x squared. So no loss of generality, but this is a convenient way to write that, that variable. So taking the left side and this constant, here's our equation we're solving for x f double prime over f is equal to minus beta x squared. And of course, that can be rewritten as f double prime plus beta x squared times f. 
is equal to zero. And what are the solutions of that? Well, you could have your f of x could be a combination of cosines and sines of beta xx with arbitrary coefficients. The second order equation has two linearly independent solutions, cosine and sine. Or we could write it in terms of complex exponentials, say a e to the minus j beta xx plus b e to the plus j beta xx. And for our purposes, the second form is more convenient. Right? You can represent any solution by either of these forms, but for us, the second form will be more convenient because it will explicitly represent waves which are traveling through space. Now, then we go back into this equation, and now f double prime over f is equal to minus beta x squared. So, this becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, minus beta x squared plus g double prime over g plus h double prime over h plus beta squared is equal to zero. Now we want to isolate the y dependence, which occurs only in the g double prime over g term. So that's going to give us g double prime over g is equal to, move everything else to the right, so this will become beta x squared minus h double prime over h plus beta squared. Now the left side is a function of y alone at most, and the right side is a function of at most z, but they're equal. So the left side can't be a function of y, because the right side is not. And so we call this minus beta y squared. Okay, and so our, our g of y will be, right, we'll use this uh, second form, some constant e to the minus j beta y y plus b e to the j beta y y. Now we can go back to this equation, plug in g double prime over g is minus beta y, and all we have is left is h double prime over h, and so we end up then with this, h double prime over h is equal to, this is minus beta x becomes beta x squared on the right, this is minus beta y becomes plus beta y squared on the right, and then we have minus beta squared and that's the right side is a constant, so the left side is a constant. Let's call this constant minus beta z squared. And from that, we get that h of z is a e to the minus j beta z, z plus b e to the plus j beta z, z. And there's one final thing we have to Enforce, and that is this equation here must be true. That is, let's rearrange this, move the minus beta z to the left and the beta, minus beta squared to the right, and we get, we must have beta x squared plus beta y squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared, which remember is omega squared mu epsilon. So we've got these three arbitrary constants except they have to satisfy this relationship for this entire separation of variables expression to be a solution of that partial differential equation. So each of the uh, f, g, and h can be this linear combination of plus and minus j, beta, x, x, or beta, y, y, or beta, z, z. And we will use the shorthand, following shorthand notation a of x, y, and z, and this will be convenient for us. We'll put inside braces two functions like e to the minus j beta xx and e to the j plus j beta xx, and that represents an arbitrary linear combination of those functions. So instead of explicitly writing them out as a e to the minus j beta z z plus b e to the minus j beta z, 
b e to the plus j beta z z we'll just put them inside these braces and we understand that that means we can take either of those functions or an arbitrary linear combination of them and in most cases we'll just take one of the functions and that's why this is a convenient notation beta z z e to the plus j beta z z so that's our general solution any linear combination of these two functions times any linear combination of those times any linear combination of those. Now, we face the problem that we talked about in the lecture on sturm liouville theory. We've got solutions that represent products of these linear combinations of x, y, and z functions. Let's rewrite that here. But there are a lot of solutions of Maxwell's equations that don't factor into a product of three functions like that. For example, here's, here's a simple example that doesn't uh, have that form. a1 e to the minus j beta x1 x e to the minus j beta y1 y e to the minus j beta z1 z plus a2 e to the minus j beta x2 x e to the minus j beta y2 y e to the minus j beta z2 z where each one of those terms is independently a solution But the sum of them can't be factored out into a single solution of this form, a factored solution. Right? Try as you may. Of course, each of the, them individually has this form, but you can't factor out all the x dependents from this function. So, and yet it's a solution because it's a superposition of two of these types of solutions. And the answer to that is kind of what this already suggests. And that is, in, in, in this case, the sturm liouville uh, theory is simply the theory of Fourier transforms and inverse transforms. We can represent an arbitrary function a of x, y, and z as an inverse three-dimensional Fourier transform, 1 over 2 pi cubed, the integral, the integral of the integral of some function s of beta x, beta y, beta z, e to the minus j, beta x, x, plus beta y, y, plus beta z, z, um, d beta x, d beta y, d beta z. Any function, uh, well-behaved function, let's say that, can be represented as an inverse Fourier transform of a three-dimensional Fourier transform uh, in this, uh, this, this form of this equation. So, and what is this term here? Well, that's one of our solutions. It's a product of one of these terms and one of those terms and one of those terms. So that says that any function can be represented as a linear superposition of the type of separation of variable solutions we've just found. So there's no loss of generality. It's true that not all solutions can be factored into a f function times a y function times a z function, but all solutions can be represented as a superposition of such factored functions. So we have not found all solutions, but we have found a basis
for all solutions, which can be formed in general by using the Fourier transform ideas. Now, let's look at a simple case where A is only a function of Z, has no X or Y dependence. What is the Helmholtz equation reduced to in that case? Well, there's no second derivative with respect to X or with respect to Y, and the second derivative with respect to Z is just an ordinary second derivative. And then we have plus beta squared A is equal to zero. And of course we know the solution to that is just the superposition of e to the minus j beta z, no longer beta sub z, but just now there's only the beta, and then e to the plus j beta z. So we're in a source-free region. So Faraday's law can be written as h is equal to j over omega mu times the curl of e. And e from Ampere's law, with, which has no j term now, no uh, current term, is equal to um, minus j over omega epsilon, the curl of h. So what is, uh, let's start with, with the Faraday's law. What is the Z component of H? HZ would be equal to J over omega mu. And let's see, the Z component of the curl is the X derivative of the Y component minus the Y derivative of the X component. But, if all of our field components, right, so A can be any one of the components of E or any one of the components of, of H or of A or of F. So if all of our field components only have Z dependence, then these X and Y derivatives would be zero. So there can be no HZ. And our field is said to be TMZ. It is a transverse magnetic field which is transverse to the, uh, the z direction. There's no z component. Well, likewise, we do the same thing with this relation, right? It's just it got a different constant. The curl of a function uh, that, that only depends on z will have no z component. So likewise, e, z is equal to zero, and that would be a t e z, a field, a transverse electric field uh, that is transverse to the z direction. So both the electric and magnetic fields are transverse to the z direction. We call that a T E M Z field. Both of the field vectors are transverse or orthogonal to the z direction. So E and H have only X and Y components. So let's take E to have just an X component. So it's A hat X, some amplitude E0, and then this, we'll take this first type of solution, E to the minus J beta Z. So what is, what is H? If we take E to have that form, because we know that the solutions are either e to the minus j beta z or e to the plus j, to j beta z or linear combination. So we'll take the first type. And e can only have x and y components, so let's just take it to have an x component for now. And then we need to figure out what h is. And we get h from this expression, from Faraday's law. So h is equal to j over omega mu, the curl of ax hat, e0, e to the minus j, beta z. And that has, itself has only one component. So it'd be j over omega mu. We know it has no z component. 
Would it have an x component? Well, what's the curl, the x component of a curl of a vector? It's the y derivative of the z component minus the z derivative of the y component. But, but e has no, z com, uh, no y component. So there's no x component of h, and the only thing that's left would be the y component. So a y hat. And that would be the z derivative of the x component of e minus that was the z derivative of the x component of e minus the x derivative of the z component of e. But e has no z component. So this is all you get. And we can do that derivative. The z derivative of e to the minus j beta z is just minus j beta times e to the minus j beta z. And if we get a minus j times j, that's minus minus 1, which is 1. This ends up being just a hat y beta over omega mu e0 e to the minus j beta z. So here's our e and our h is a y hat we'll call its amplitude h0 e to the minus j beta z and what's the relation between h0 and e0 well this is h0 right here so we have that h0 is equal to beta over omega mu e0 or turning that around e0 is omega mu over beta h0. And this term right there we call eta. Characteristic impedance of the medium. Why is it an impedance? Because the electric field has units of volts per meter. And the magnetic field has units of amps per meter. So, E0 over H0 must have units of volts per meter over amps per meter. That's volts per amps. That would be units of ohms, of impedance. And we write that as eta is equal to omega mu over beta. And let's see, that's omega mu, and what is beta? Beta squared is omega squared mu epsilon, so beta is omega square root of mu epsilon. And the omegas cancel, and th this square root cancels a square root from there, leaving square root of mu over epsilon. So, important formula, eta is equal to the square root of mu over epsilon, called the characteristic impedance of the medium, of the material. For free space, a to zero is square root of mu zero over epsilon zero, and if you punch those numbers in, you get something that's very close to 377 ohms. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that if you took an ohm meter and you put the leads into it, a vacuum, you would measure 377 ohms. This is not an actual resistance, DC resistance of a material. Instead, it's a ratio of an electric and magnetic field. Since the electric field has units of volts per meter and the magnetic field of amps per meter, that ratio has units of volts per amps or ohms. But it's not, that, that doesn't mean that it's the same kind of ohms that you get in a resistor. So, eta is the square root of mu over epsilon. If mu and epsilon are both real, then eta is real. If either of mu or epsilon are complex, it's a lossy material, then eta will in general be complex. So now let's look at the pointing vector. P is one half the real part of E cross H conjugate. 
And so we've said that E is in the X direction. H is parallel to the Y direction. And the cross product of E and H then will be the cross product of AX hat, AY hat will be in the Z direction. So that'll be the pointing vector, which will be parallel to the A hat Z direction. So the electric field, the magnetic field, and the pointing vector form the set of three mutually perpendicular vectors, the triple of orthogonal vectors. And what specifically will those values be? Well, the, cross, the magnitude of the cross product when the two vectors are perpendicular is just equal to the product of the magnitudes. So this will just be one half the real part of E0, H0 conjugate in the Z direction. And what is that? So H0, right, H0 is equal to E0 over eta, because E0 is equal to eta times H0. So we conjugate this, so that'll be E0 conjugated over N, uh, eta conjugated times E0. So E0 times E0 conjugate will be the magnitude of E0 squared and then we'd have, if eta is real, then it would just be over eta. For now, we'll assume that eta is real, so that mu and epsilon are real. And we're going to call this a plane wave, and we'll see why in just a moment. Now, the x, y, and z coordinate system is not physical. It's a mathematical construct that we impose on space. We can put it in any orientation we want. And so we could take this solution and rotate it, right, and have it be oriented in any direction in space. We could rotate the pointing vector in any direction, and then we could rotate about the pointing vector, the E and H fields. So we can generate an infinite family of other solutions from this single solution. So let's look at this, uh, this solution in a little more uh, detail. Let's now use our trick that, remember, we're solving things in the phasor domain. If we want to go back into the time domain, if we want to know what the electric field is as a function of time and space, well, we take the real part of the phasor times e to the j omega t. And what is that? Well, if we assume e0 is real, that would just be e0. And then the real part of this would just be the cosine omega t minus beta z. Oops, not beta sub z, but beta times z. Well, actually, let's write it as omega t minus beta z. And let's analyze this a little bit. Let's see. So first of all, notice uh, that this is uh, periodic. And just for completeness, that's if, if e0 is a positive real number. Um, otherwise, if E0 is complex, this would be the magnitude of E0 cosine omega t minus beta z plus phase angle of E0. So in either case, this function Right, this is a real function of space and time, is periodic in space. Why? Because if we take z and we replace it by z plus or minus lambda, what do we get? Let's just take the first form up here. It's the easiest to work with. We'll get the cosine omega t minus beta z 
plus or minus lambda, which is some, some number, real number, and that will be equal to the cosine omega t minus beta z minus or plus beta lambda. And if beta lambda is equal to 2 pi, well, that's just adding or subtracting 2 pi from the argument of a cosine, which doesn't change its value. It just moves you one time around the circle, the unit circle. So if this is true, and lambda is equal to 2 pi over beta, then that is the spatial period of this field. And we call that the wavelength. And so this is a sinusoidal field, and the distance between peaks or between valleys or between zeros is called the wavelength, lambda, which is 2 pi over this propagation of phase constant beta. And that also allows us then to turn around and write beta in a little more physically meaningful form. Beta is equal to 2 pi over the wavelength. Lambda has units of meters length, and so beta has units of inverse or per meter. Now another thing we can say looking at this, uh, this function, cosine omega t minus beta z, is if we make the replacement t is replaced by t plus some delta t, and z is replaced by z plus some delta z, and we want the cosine to have the same value, well, if omega delta t minus beta delta z is equal to zero, right, which would be the change in this argument of the cosine, from the first term we get an, an omega delta t, and for the second one a minus beta delta z, that will be true if delta z over delta t, and I move this to the other side, divide by delta t, divide by beta, and you get that delta z over delta t is omega over beta, which is, let's see, that's omega, and beta is omega root mu epsilon. So this is just 1 over root mu epsilon, and it's a distance over time, which has units of velocity, and we call that the phase velocity, V phase. So what does that mean? That means that over time, this function, cosine omega t minus beta z, represents this sinusoid that is moving in the z direction with a velocity v phase. And so here's another really important result. v phase is 1 over the square root mu epsilon. And this is assuming that mu and epsilon are both real. And an important special case is in free space, where we call, call the phase velocity c, the speed of light, 1 over the square root mu 0 epsilon 0. And that is, by definition, exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. If you are in a medium where mu is mu relative times mu zero and epsilon is epsilon relative times epsilon zero, then plugging that into this expression up here, we have that the phase velocity is, well, if we factor out the, <coughs> excuse me, mu relative and the epsilon relative, we're left with mu zero and epsilon zero, and that gives us the speed of light. So we get the speed of light over the square root of mu relative, epsilon relative. And we sometimes, especially in optics, would write that as C over N, where N is the square root of mu relative, epsilon relative, is called the index of refraction. 
the index of refraction is that number by which you divide the speed of light to get the phase velocity in that medium. Sometimes you call this phase, people will call this phase velocity the speed of light in that medium, but that can be a little confusing. We like to refer to the speed of light as this constant, which is the speed of light, the phase velocity in empty space. And in, in a different medium, light travels at the phase velocity, which is speed of light divided by the index of refraction. And since V phase is omega over beta, that also allows us to get a different formula for beta. Beta is equal to omega over the phase velocity. Or using the phase velocity as C over N, that's N omega over the speed of light. And then because lambda is equal to 2 pi over beta, we can also write lambda as 2 pi times the phase velocity over omega, or 2 pi times the speed of light over n omega. And since omega is equal to 2 pi times the hertz frequency of the field, right? omega is in radians per second, f is in cycles per second, or hertz, then we can also write lambda using that idea as just B phase over F or C over N F. Okay, so those are all convenient ways to represent these different parameters. Beta is the phase parameter, lambda is the wavelength, V phase is the phase velocity. So our solution is E equals AX hat E0 E to the minus J beta Z H equals AY hat E0 over eta E to the minus J beta Z and the pointing vector P is the magnitude of E0 squared over 2 eta a z hat or we could put that first if we wanted to just to make it have the same form a z hat magnitude of e zero squared over 2 eta so in the x y plane e is in the x direction and h is in the y direction and then p is sticking out of the board in the z direction now we said that we can rotate arbitrarily that solution and one of the things we can obviously do is just rotate it about the pointing vector about the a hat z direction let's rotate it 90 degrees so that e is now in the y direction so we would have a new solution e is equal to a y hat e zero e to the minus j beta z. And how about h? Well, let's see. h would rotate over 90 degrees here. It would be in the minus x direction. So it would be minus a hat x e0 over eta e to the minus j beta z. And p wouldn't change because you're just rotating it about the z axis and it's along the z axis so it doesn't change. So this is a solution in which E is in the y direction and H is in the minus x direction and Z, uh, uh, P is still in the z direction. The direction of the electric field we refer to as the polarization and we would say this field is polarized uh, polarized sorry not polarization polarized in the a hat x direction 
And to be more specific, and we'll see why in a moment, this is linearly polarized in the a hat x direction. The electric field E, as a function of time, goes up and back and forth uh, along the x-axis. Over here, we would say this is a field that is linearly polar polarized in the a hat y direction. So in this case, the electric field goes up and down in the y direction as a function of time. Now we can take linear combinations of these solutions. So let's take the first one times cosine of theta, where theta is some angle, and the second one times the sine of theta, where theta is some angle. And what do we end up with? We get the electric field is equal to, well, we have a at hat x times cosine of theta. And over for this one, we're going to get a hat y times sine of theta. And they both have an e0 and e to the minus j beta z. And for h, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get uh, a hat y cosine theta minus a hat x sine of theta. So for h, we're going to get a hat y cosine of theta minus a hat x sine of theta e0 over eta e to the minus j beta z. What will we get for the pointing vector? Well, if we, we're putting a vector or cosine of theta in here with the E0, we're going to square that. So we're going to get cosine squared for that. And over here, we'll have a factor of sine theta in with the E0. We square that. That gets sine squared. So we get cosine squared plus sine squared. Well, that's just equal to 1. So we get the same pointing vector. So the pointing vector is still a hat z. Magnitude of E0 squared over 2 eta. And what does this field look like? Well, this represents a unit vector in a direction theta relative to the x-axis. So this would represent an electric field polarized at an angle theta. And this is rotated 90 degrees from it. This would be the magnetic field, would be over in this direction there, where that is an extra 90 degrees. We could say this field is linearly polarized um, we could say at an angle theta. relative to the x-axis. So as time goes on, this electric field oscillates back and forth along a line that is rotated in angle theta relative to the x-axis. So that shows you that the x and y linear polarizations form a basis for any linear polarization at any angle. I can rotate this angle theta all the way around the circle put it in any direction. And it's all represented as a superposition of x polarization and y polarization. So any linear polarization for a field traveling along the z-axis can be represented as <clears throat> a combination of these two solutions we just derived. Another way we could combine the x and y linear polarizations would be to introduce a phase shift. So we'll have E is equal to E zero over the square root of two. We'll see the reason for this in a moment. A hat x minus j 
a y hat times e to the minus j beta z. So this is the x linear polarization minus j times the y linear polarization. Of course, a factor of j is e to the j pi over 2. So minus that is e to the minus j pi over 2. That introduces a minus 90 degree phase shift. And the magnetic field would be e0 over the square root of 2 eta. And that would be a y hat. And let's see, minus j times minus a hat x is plus j a hat x e to the minus j beta z. And you can do the one half real part of e cross h for this. And you end up with exactly the result we had before a hat z magnitude of e0 squared over 2 eta, and that's what the square root of 2 in the denominator is. If we didn't have that, we'd end up with a, a, a factor of 2 here, twice as much power as the previous results. So what does this field do? What is the nature of this polarization? Well, let's look at the field at z is equal to 0. So in the xy plane, we'll have e 0 t. Let's look at the real field. So this will be e0 over the square root of 2 times the real part of this expression. But at z is equal to 0, e to the minus j beta 0 is just e to the 0 is 1. So we'll just have a hat x minus j a y hat times e to the j omega t. And what is that? That is e0 over the square root of 2. And let's see, you'd have a hat x times the cosine omega t. And minus j times j sine omega t. So that'd be plus a hat y sine omega t. So what is this? What does this do as a function of time? Well, this thing traces out a circle. It's a circle of radius e0 over the square root of 2. And as a function of time, that's the angle well, theta is equal to omega t. So here's the electric field. And as a function of time, it just goes around this circle. So this is called circular polarization. And explicitly, this one goes around in a counterclockwise sense. And if you stick your right thumb in the direction, this is x and this is y, and it's propagating in the z direction. If you put your thumb in the direction of propagation along the z-axis, your right fingers curl around in the direction that the electric field circulates, and so we call that right-handed circular polarization. If instead we would put a plus j here and a minus j there, conjugated these terms, we would get left-handed. So this guy goes in that direction, uh, you could get left-handed circular polarization, in which case the electric field would rotate around this way, go in the clockwise direction. That would be left-handed circular polarization. Since you can make linear polarizations as superpositions of left and right handed polarization right so the, the this is the right handed left handed would have a plus j here if you add those together the plus and minus j a y hats would cancel you just have a hat x that'd be linear polarization and likewise you can make linear combination of these that would give you only the a hat y 
And since the a hat x and a hat y, the x and y linear polarizations are a basis for any linear polarization, you can also represent linear polarizations as combinations of circular polarization. And then you can make other combinations where you, instead of just adding these with a plus or minus j factor, you also include different amplitudes, and then you get what's called elliptical polarization. In communication, these kinds of polarizations are very common. Uh, so if, you're, if this is the Earth, very common to have linear antennas that stick upwards perpendicular to the Earth. And in that case, the electric field is as a linear polarization. So you have a reference plane, which is the Earth, and so everybody just agrees to put their antennas perpendicular to the Earth, and then everybody can communicate. This is linearly polarized and hits this antenna that's in the same direction, so the electric field is going to induce current density up and down in the antenna, and you can receive the signal. Now, if two antennas are perpendicular to each other, or another way to say that is if the electric field is polarized, say, up and down, and you put your antenna perpendicular, well, the electric field can't push charges along the antenna because it's pushing perpendicular. And so you get no reception in that case. So that becomes a problem if you no longer have the surface of the Earth as a reference. So if you're communicating with people in the air, or especially in space, you don't have a plane of reference. And so in that case, you would want to use circular polarization. Because now it doesn't matter. If I rotate with respect to the circular polarization, all it does is introduce a, a small time delay in the electric field. The field is still going to go around in a circle. no matter. And a circle is, of course, symmetric with respect to rotation about the axis of the circle. So this is why you typically on the Earth you use linear polarization and, say, in space, or including also often communicating With, from between space and Earth, we often use circular polarization. For that reason. So far we've been assuming that mu and epsilon are real. So now let's turn and explore the possibility of lossy media, where mu might be complex, mu c. We'll write it as mu prime minus j mu double prime, and epsilon might be complex, epsilon c, of the form epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. So now when we go to calculate beta squared, it also will be complex. We'll write it as beta c squared. What is that? It's equal to omega squared times mu epsilon, but that will be mu prime minus j mu double prime times epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. And you can break out the real and imaginary parts there. You got mu prime epsilon prime minus j minus j is uh, minus one and then we've got mu double prime epsilon double prime and then we've got two cross terms both with a minus j we've got mu prime epsilon double prime and then we've got epsilon prime mu double prime so beta c squared is complex has a negative imaginary part and so the square root of that will also have a negative imaginary part and we'll write that beta c is equal to omega times the square root of mu c epsilon c is equal to beta minus j alpha there's the negative imaginary part where the real part beta is omega times the real part 
of the square root of mu c epsilon c. We call that the phase constant. And minus alpha is omega times the imaginary part of root mu c epsilon c. We call alpha, beta is the phase constant. Alpha we call the uh, attenuation. constant because as the field propagates with e to the minus j beta c z dependence let's see minus j times beta c well you'd have minus j times minus j that's minus one alpha so e to the minus alpha z and then just minus j beta c e to the minus j beta z. So just as before, we got e to the minus j beta z. Beta is called the phase constant. As z increases, that changes the phase of the field. But now we've got e to the minus alpha z. As z increases, for in that case, the amplitude of the field decreases. It attenuates. And that's why it's called the attenuation constant. So now we might have an electric field, E, which is, let's say, polarized in the x direction. Initial amplitude, E0 drops off as e to the minus alpha z as it propagates. Phase constant e to the minus j beta z. Obviously that's gonna decay exponentially as you propagate in the z direction. And we quantify that by saying at a distance delta, it'll drop to e to the minus alpha delta. And if we set that to be equal to e to the minus one, uh, that would be a distance delta, which is 1 over alpha, which we call the skin depth of the material. It gives you a measure of how far uh, in a material a wave will propagate before it drops to an amplitude of 1 over E, 1 over 2.7 roughly, of its initial value. And if omega and epsilon, I'm sorry, if mu and epsilon are complex, then so too will be the impedance, eta. So eta will be eta c, square root of mu c over epsilon c. And so when we write that the magnetic field is a hat y for this electric field, e0 over eta c, e to the minus alpha z, e to the minus j beta z, if eta now is complex, that means it also has a magnitude and a phase. So it introduces a phase shift in the magnetic field relative to the electric field. Whereas in a lossless medium, the electric and magnetic fields are in phase as they, as they oscillate in time and space. So they, they reach their peak values at the same position in time, and they reach their zeros at the same position in time. But now with this phase shift, that will no longer be the case. E and H will reach peak values at different times at a given location or at different locations for a given time. We can work out the pointing vector, real at E cross H, and you end up with A hat Z, magnitude E zero squared over two, but now, not over 2 eta, because eta is complex, you've got to now put the real part of 1 over eta c conjugate. And then you get an e to the minus alpha z from each of the e and h, so you've got e to the minus 2 alpha z. So power density drops as e to the minus 2 alpha z as the field propagates. We can still define the wavelength as 2 pi over beta, but just keep in mind that beta now is omega times the real part of the square root of mu complex epsilon complex. You don't put the complex numbers in the formula for the wavelength. You put the, this real number beta. And the phase velocity, likewise, is still omega over beta with the same caveat.
in the PDF notes, we analyze a little more in a little more detail the case where it's a non-magnetic material, so the mu is equal to just mu zero, the free space value, and the loss is in the dielectric constant or in the permittivity. Epsilon c is epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. So in this case, beta c is beta minus j alpha is omega times the square root of mu zero times the square root of epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. A little easier to analyze. And we look at uh, two, two important limits. One is called the good dielectric limit. And that's where the epsilon double prime, the imaginary part, is much smaller than the real part. And this is often quantified by defining epsilon relative prime to be the epsilon prime over epsilon zero. It's basically the dielectric constant. And then the tangent of delta, or well, the loss tangent, is equal to epsilon double prime over epsilon prime. And so in this good dielectric case, this is a very small number, this tangent. Right, so this comes from thinking of a picture that would look like this. Here's epsilon double prime. Here's epsilon prime. And this is an angle delta. So in that case, um, we find that beta is well approximated by beta zero times the square root of epsilon relative prime, where beta zero is just omega times the square root of mu zero epsilon zero. It would be the propagation or the phase constant in free space at that same frequency. And the attenuation factor, or constant rather, is approximately beta over 2 times tangent of delta, where this is the beta. So plug it in there. Another limit is the good conductor. Limit. And this is the opposite case, where epsilon double prime is much, much bigger than epsilon prime. And this limit has um, alpha about equal to beta, about equal to omega square root mu zero epsilon double prime, all over two. So in this case, the phase constant and the attenuation constant are approximately equal. And so <clears throat> um, within one wavelength of, of phase change, uh, you get a significant amount of attenuation. So the, the field attenuates very rapidly. And the skin depth, 1 over alpha then, would be 2 over omega root mu zero epsilon double prime.